Good morning, people. Uh, I normally don't wake up this early, so <laughs> bear with me on this. Um, I'd probably like to start off by giving you guys maybe a little background on myself, so that way some things will make sense. Um, I am a therapist by circumstance. <laughs> uh, never really set out to do it. I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, deployed to Afghanistan, spent over a year, um, deployed in Kandahar, dealt with all types of stuff. Um, got out, start to pursue my education a little bit more seriously, and I was the type of guy that always wanted to start from the bottom and learn everything, so I started working in all these various hospitals as techs and things like that to kind of learn uh, my craft. Uh, in the middle of that, I became a firefighter. Um, so I was at least I'm a firefighter for six years. Uh, that's a long another story on how that happened. Needless to say, some friends wanted me to take them to an open house and they were too drunk to go. So I went in their stead and that's how I became a firefighter. So uh, we'll be talking about some things that are very near and dear to my heart because I work primarily with active duty military, veterans and first responders. It's a program we created. Um, I've been involved with it in numerous iterations. We're at Research Psychiatric Center for a couple of years and now we're a signature, but overall about six years, you know, in iterations of this program. What this means for some of you that got the glassy look on your face is if you have delicate sensibilities, I'm probably going to offend them, all right? I'm a Marine. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best, all right? But I talk to combat deployed people every day. So let's just say that my language sometimes gets a bit colorful, all right? <laughs> So keep that in mind. One of the most important things about this for me is I found out very, very quickly that as I was doing therapy, that my patients had no real understanding of trauma. Some of these guys had been deployed multiple times. Some of them had been in services for years and they didn't even have what I would consider a rudimentary understanding of trauma. So this is actually a group that I give to my patients. Now it's pared down for them, but it'll be a little bit heavy, heavier for you guys. But one of the things that I want you guys to be aware of is there are functional and structural differences between how trauma affects the mind and then it affects your brain. So we're talking about physiological versus psychological. A lot of times what happens is people understand the psychological effects, so that's what they end up doing. They end up trying to beat the system. You know, I'm having nightmares, I'm doing all this stuff, so as long as I'm able to drink, pass out, then I don't care. They have no understanding of how the brain is really being affected on a physiological level. So that's some of the things we'll talk about. I am not a death by PowerPoint person, so I don't know if that's what you speakers have done before. I'm not doing that. The fact that I'm chained right here already is an annoyance, so I'll work through that. <laughs> Because normally I'd be all around talking. But a uh, quick overview. We're going to talk about what trauma is, right? We're going to talk about the relationship between trauma and memory. We're going to talk about the triumphant, all right, in the brain of trauma, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex, which I'm pretty sure you guys all understand, uh, hopefully. <laughs> trauma trigger process. Uh, we'll do an overview of the brain's relationship. I'll answer any questions at the end if you want. And my resources are impeccable because I'm a KU grad, so we can can move through that. All right. <laughs> All right. So first, what is trauma, right? So when we're talking about trauma, most of the time in my setting, we're talking about psychological trauma. If you were to say trauma to people, depending on their background and their setting, trauma can mean a lot of different things. When I was in a, when I was a firefighter, trauma did not mean psychological damage, right? If you're in the ER, it doesn't mean. So when we're talking about trauma for all intents and purposes of this instruction, we're talking about psychological damage, right? What's very important about trauma is it is a result of an overwhelming amount of stress to exceed one's ability to cope, right? What that means is we all have a baseline or a threshold, every one of us. And when that is exceeded, that's when it becomes traumatic. David, me, I grew up with, uh, I have 14 siblings. So a Thanksgiving at my house is normal for me. But if you don't have 14 siblings, it's traumatic, all right? You can't sit around and talk. This ain't the time. You get your food, you take care of business, you talk later. So we're talking about how it goes past that threshold, right? But it's also the subjective experience. So trauma is not just about exceeding the threshold, but the subjectivity of it. What that means is when I, when I got to Afghanistan, small arms exchange did not bother me. I grew up in the hood. So weapons fire 
mortars, that puckered my asshole, right? That was the thing where it was death from above. So that was my experience. That's where it went past my threshold. Once I started dealing with death from above, that changed everything, right? For a couple of months. And then what happened is, after a couple of months of being in that environment, I wouldn't even stop playing spades because now I needed a new level. It wasn't hitting us. Or if it was hitting us, it wasn't. So now my threshold changed. So keeping that in mind, I want you guys to be tracking how that works. Um, one of the things about psychological distress is there's a belief system, right? Schemas. How we perceive things ultimately becomes our reality. So when you're talking about trauma, the more you believe you're endangered, the more traumatized you'll be. This throws a lot of people out when we talk about diagnosis because, you know, DSM made uh, some changes with PTSD and a couple other trauma and stress related disorders. But the one thing I get from a lot of laymen is, is, well, how can you have it if you haven't actually experienced it? You know, for you guys, when you hear that question, a really good way to say that is you don't have to experience it firsthand to have an emotional effect. Everybody, you know, unfortunately may have lost someone that they weren't right there next to. But the minute you heard about it, you had that emotional connection to it because it didn't have to be firsthand. It was a loss. It was the grief cycle. It was all those things. Well, trauma happens the same way. This is why we could all have something happen in this room and all of us could have a different response to it because it depends on how it's affecting us. Right. There may or may not be bodily injury. OK. But psychological trauma is normally coupled with physiological upheaval. So that's where you get those long range effects. Once the psychology starts to get involved, the physio physiology follows. So when your brain starts thinking stuff, your body's like, well, I guess you're giving me the clues, right? So when we're talking about trauma, I want you guys to take that as a snapshot. That's what trauma is. Notice that I didn't give you a descriptor of an actual traumatic event because it's too subjective. You know, I have 19 year old kids in my program that are at Leavenworth and white men and well, all over the world. And they come to us and they may have wanted to kill themselves because of a relationship that went awry. Now, David is 37. I've been married for a very long time. I may want to tell that kid, you got at least two more wives and a couple of more girlfriends before you get to the point where you're going to experience a trauma loss. But to that 19 year old kid that lost that relationship, that's the most traumatic thing that's happened in their world. So that's how we're looking at trauma. Trauma and memory. When we're talking about trauma and memory as a descriptor, we're talking about the same thing, different points in time. So not only do they share these very special characteristics, it actually helps each other through defense mechanisms. So I'm a competent therapist, all right? I think I got a pretty level, high level of clinical acumen. But if someone was getting attacked by a cougar, in the moment, I can't say, use your fucking coping skills. You can do, like, that's not gonna work. Well, why? Because the events actually happening to them, right? If they survive it, what I get to do is what? Deal with the memory of the attack. That's what therapy ends up becoming. It is about the memory of the attack. So when we're talking about trauma and memory, we're talking about the same thing, time split, right? Um, of course, you're going to see a lot of different defense mechanisms come into play, right? Not too Freudian, but there's some truth to it. Uh, disassociated amnesia, memory loss, suppression, repression, among other things. When the brain gets involved, there are three parts that are waiting all the time to keep you safe, to react to trauma. Those are the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. We're going to talk about these in specifics, but we're also going to talk, to, talk about them as a whole. Anytime, by the way, you guys got any questions that are super pertinent, you can always stop me and ask that, but we will have time later for it. So limbic system, right? We got, um, you guys pretty much know what that is, right? I'm speaking to, speaking to the choir, right? So when we're talking about the limbic system, what's important about that is the brain deals with hierarchy very, very differently. As you guys know, the systems that are created first Afterwards, there's very little veto power, right? So as you move up from that brain stem, you move up into that limbic system, you move up to the prefrontal cortex, as your brain is being built, right? There are systems that are hardwired, rightfully so. I have dealt with probably over a thousand patients and I've seen everything from some very, very unique, bizarre, and sometimes esoteric ways that they wanted to kill themselves to the garden variety, I want to shoot myself in the head. But you know the one thing a patient's never told me? David, I'm just gonna hold my breath until I die. 
Well, you know why? Because the part of the brain that controls that, you don't get to control. There's a hierarchy to it. You can't control your heartbeat. You can't control your breath. That's why we drown. I mean, that's honestly what it is. You cognitively know you can't breathe water, but when you're down there and that system says open up and inhale, you're bringing in. So when we're talking about that limbic system, we're talking about this hierarchical place. We're talking about how the brain is working. That hippocampus just happens to be in there, right? So you're talking about consolidation of information, short-term and long-term memory, spatial navigation. Singular cortex, right? A lot of interesting research coming out with the singular cortex. Highly in influential in linking behavioral outcomes to motivation. That's the reason why I'm here this early, all right? Singular cortex got me out of bed, all right? <laughs> Olfactory cortex, right? This always goes back to when people say, well, how is memory and smell so tied together? Because the part of your brain that's in there, you know, and we can, we can take it from a different place, but that cortex is there. It's taking in all that information. Hypothalamus, right, our catch-all for a lot of things. Nervous system, the endocrine, controls body temperature, hunger, important aspects of parenting and attachment behaviors, thirst, fatigue, sleep, circadian rhythms. What's important about that? What do you think trauma's doing? It's playing havoc in the limbic system. So when you talk to a patient, what do they say are their symptoms? When you talk about symptomology, I'm having nightmares, I can't sleep, I don't wanna eat, I don't wanna, guess what? That's what we're talking about right there. We're not talking about a cognitive thing, we're talking about the organ itself being affected by trauma, right? And the amygdala, right? It is our fear center, if you will, and it plays a primary role in the decision making. Once it has dominance, it does not give it back until it thinks you're safe. Hippocampus, right? You guys are all doctors, aspiring doctors and physicians, all right? I didn't understand it because I'm a Marine, I'm kind of a rock, but <laughs> the Greeks, the Latins, they, they enjoyed looking at nature and naming things after that. So the hippocampus means seahorse, and that little squiggly thing to them, <laughs> that ganglia looking thing, that was a seahorse. I don't get it, but right on, you guys enjoy it, all right? Um, Hippocampus consolidates short-term as well as long-term. So we're talking about declarative data, right? And it handles spatial navigation. What's funny about the hippocampus is that spatial navigation is neural mapping to its finest. This is why some of you, you think you're atypical, but you, you, you may think, oh, I have OCD characteristics. That's that neural map, right? You can go in your house and see if a pen has been moved a millimeter because your brain is taking a picture of that. You're good with that. And as you move throughout your environment, you know when things are off. As a firefighter, this is one of our key tools for how we navigated a dark room, right? We didn't just go into a house and say, we don't know what's going on. We studied houses. Every time we went on a call, my captain said, study the layout of this house. Is this a ranch? Is this a three? Because when you go into this house, same style, another house, you need to have that in your mind as you're moving through it. That's that spatial navigation piece, right? It also transfers integrated stored memory to another part of the brain, right? Theories hold prefrontal cortex, right? So it's moving those memories to a part, probably what, what I've read, right, you know, and we know theories are there, but what I've read is the, the VPFC, right, ventral media prefrontal cortex. Hippocampus processes trauma memories by recycling memories mostly at night via dreams. This can take place over weeks or months. This is where I jam up most of my patients, right? As you get out there and you start dealing with especially trauma, right, PTSD, acute stress disorder, things like that, they're going to complain of nightmares a lot, you know. We're gonna be giving them prezosin and things like that. But what they have to understand is nightmares are a part of the process. That's a part of how your brain is trying to process. What happens is we interrupt that process. You know, our fear, our inability to move through it. So you end up hitting the pause button and then every night reliving the same thing. Short-term recollection, right? So as we go into how your brain is putting these memories together. That hippocampus is taking those memories and it's putting it there for specific reasons. Some may say, well, if the limbic system is about survival, why was the hippocampus there? Well, because you needed to not get bit by the same dog four times in a row, right? You needed to be able to know what was dangerous out there. So your hippocampus said, let me feed myself some information so that it doesn't happen, right? Now, what's funny about that is how we see, you know, current research, what it shows is when the hippocampus is involved, it's actually taking different memories of an event and putting them together in an episode. You know, it's what we call episodic memory. So it puts it all together. If you have, you know, uh, for me, an example of this is, and I'm only 37, so keep in mind, but uh, I remember my first breakup. And I remember the song that was playing. It was an Usher song. 
I hate that damn Usher song, right? Because as my 12-year-old heart was being broken, that song was playing, right? Because young people, we didn't have all this extra stuff, right? You know, people would have to listen to the radio, play it in the background, all that stuff, right? So she's breaking my heart to this song. So now that all of that's involved, anytime I hear that, I can have the best day of my life. If I hear that song, Instantly, I'm like, ah, why? I don't care about her. I've, well, I've Facebook stalked her a couple of times. She's fine. We're, we're, we're living good lives. She's happy. I'm happy. But that episodic memory is right there. It is right there. It is stuck in me because once that happened, look, sight, smells, the more senses that are involved in the memory, the more powerful the episode is. So when you think about trauma, how many senses are involved in a traumatic memory? If I have a victim of sexual assault, they are in sensory overload above threshold. So yes, those are some very powerful memories. As memories are played through the hippocampus, right, the connections between those neurons start to get, you know, embedded, right? So it becomes a fixed combination. This is why, you know, uh, the example is if you hear a piece of music, you're likely to be flooded with memories. This is probably one of the main reasons that Weddings are different for men and women, right? So a woman, and I'm being sexist at this point, but I just, for the, <laughs> for the sake of <laughs> example, I want you guys to flow with me. So a woman's sitting there, me and my wife are married, and she's looking at me like I'm the greatest guy in the world, and they're playing our song. And it's incredible to her, right? I don't know what our song is, right? Because my fixed combination was not that. I'm looking at the itchy tie that I'm in, my friends, I'm ready to get out of this. They're already drunk. It's a lot of stuff going on for me. But in that moment for her, she's looking at sparkles in her eyes. All these things are going. It is a fixed combination. So 10 years later, she's like, they're playing our song. And I'm like, damn, is that our song? It, <laughs> but she'll get mad because I can remember the score from a game th 20 years ago. Well, why do you remember that? Because we were at the house, my friends were there, it's, I'm eating, everything. So that's how fixed combinations are working. The more and more that's involved in it, the more so it's not that you are necessarily, some of you, I'll give you a pass, don't go home and try to use it on your spouses. But what's happening is, if it's not being fixed, if it's not being relayed, if those neurons aren't connecting, then you're just not going to be able to just react to it the same way. Um, high levels of stress hormones, right? cause hippocampus to shrink, undervelop, resulting in impaired functioning. Once stress gets in the system, right? Once that cortisol is in the system, it starts a process of pretty much duck, duck, goose. It's trying to pick the goose in your system. It's trying to find whatever's gonna keep me alive, that's what I care about. You don't have time to be processing memories when you're trying to survive. So it starts to degrade, you know, the tissue and things like that. Childhood trauma exaggerates the effect, right? What we're finding out from VA research, um, and others is a lot of our guys and girls that are coming back, they already probably were above threshold, childhood trauma, and then they get out there and guess what happens? It pushes them over because they're already dealing with half a deck if you wanna put it that way. Trauma memories that remain unprocessed can be disintegrated, fragmented, and feel current rather than in the past. This is a telltale sign that someone is dealing with a trauma memory. If it feels current to them, that lets you know something. So I want you to think of um, the brain as like a big box store, like UP UPS. So what happens is the hippocampus is working the night shift, right? And if you ever work night shift, nobody knows what the hell you're doing. You cut, like you're off the beaten path, right? Day shift doesn't know what you did all night. You know what's going on. So the hippocampus is going through these boxes every night. And these boxes are memories. Anytime it's interrupted, it just puts the box to the side and it keeps working, right? So every time it's interrupted via nightmare, fear, dissociation, what it's doing is it's leaving that box sitting there. Now what happens is because of how the brain is structured, those boxes don't go anywhere. So what a patient ends up doing is trying to cognitively trick themselves. They say things like, you know what? I'm really, really, really stressed out today. I know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna drink. Because if I drink, then I can just go into the oblivion of sleep and not have to worry about that. Okay, genius. So you drank, right? So the day is gone. But what happens with the night shift? 
those boxes are still getting gone through. This is why you can go to any major city in America and still see a Vietnam vet on the streets. How long has it been since they wore that uniform? How long has it been since they've been in that war? That box is still there. And what happens with our patients is those boxes start to have dates on them. They're not going anywhere. This happened to me in 2003. This happened to me in 1997. This happened to me in 1987. And they're afraid and those boxes start piling up. So now what they're doing is they are what I call psychological hoarders, right? When I was a firefighter, I went in a lot of people's houses. If you've ever been in a hoarder's house, it's an experience, right? Because the hoarder will have, let's say, 2,000 square feet of house, but they're living in 600 of it. They have paths grooved out on how they're going to move. This is how your patients begin to live their lives when they're traumatized. They are trying to not hit a box because they don't want to be triggered. So it's no wonder why they don't like to be around people, why they want to stay in their homes, why they are obsessive about their privacy and things like that. Because what they're trying to say without really understanding it is, I don't want to be triggered. So they externalize that threat and they say, everybody's a threat. That's easier for me to deal with than the fact that it's really my own stuff. One of the very first patients I got in my program was a cut, excuse me, combat medic from a local base. He came to my program because, in his words, things are fucked up, right? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, he lived on post, and he was having such distressing traumatic symptoms that he was getting up and ending up being in his neighbor's house. He would get up, have nightmares, walk across his neighbor to the point where they started leaving the door open. So he sits down with me, we do our intake, right? And we're getting into trauma therapy. And he's telling me that, you know, I don't know why I'm acting like this. Everything should be good. I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, well, there was this one time that I was in Iraq where we hit an IED and we lost three people. But that was like 10 years ago, David. I should be over that. Well, what help did you get? Any medication, any therapy? No, no, I, I just got drunk with my friends and we just kind of kept moving. That box is still there. And it took us doing therapy to uncover that box. And that's what you're looking at every day. By the way, some people born with smaller hippocampuses make them more vulnerable to develop PTSD or trauma symptomology because you're talking about the organ that's supposed to be help, helping you process it. So just by genetics, you can come into a situation where you, you already have a disadvantage. Trauma memories, that are played out as nightmares. The reason why we know they're trauma memory versus just a, oh, I thought I was in class and I was naked type of thing, right? Um, is because it's consistent. The theme is consistent and it's recurrent. That's how you know you're dealing with a trauma nightmare. It is the same thing on loop. It is that hippocampal region trying to process things, right? It's, it's, it's this never, I've had patients describe it as being on a roller coaster that never goes down. Think of how frightening that is to just keep ticking up and the world is getting smaller and smaller. That's where they're stuck. They don't know how to move past that piece. They're stuck in that, right? Um, talking about REM cycles, in REM, you guys get all this, so I won't have to go deep into that. But think about it. If these guys are hitting REM periods of sleep and in that period of sleep they're uncovering boxes, they have no idea what's going on because most of them don't realize that you dream, but that does not mean you remember them. That does not mean that that prefrontal cortex is activated and that you know that you were dreaming, but you're dreaming every night because sleep is two parts. It's restorative and it's recuperative. Restorative is for the body. It's just, hey, I'm standing still, I'm resting. Recuperative is for the mind. You're not brain dead when you go to sleep. It's the other side of the coin. So a lot of these guys are waking up and they're like, well, I don't, I don't think I'm dreaming, David. I'm not having nightmares. Okay, well, ask, let me ask you this. You've been asleep because you're depressed 10 hours and you woke up angry. Why? If you've had 10 hours on the clock sleep, you should wake up refreshed. You should be ready to go. But if I'm opening up these boxes for 10 hours, things start to change. Right. But this is also why they can take a 20 minute cat nap and feel invigorated because they didn't open up a box. There's nothing in them that opened up that box. So they're like, oh, my, I got the. And this is why they run. That's why comorbidity becomes such an issue with trauma, because they're running to things that are going to 
pretty much try to shut that out. It's still going on. They haven't done anything. Think about it. And this is what I tell my patients who are adamant about uh, their comorbidity. Well, I drink, you know, I hate the self-medication and the pop psychology term, but I'm trying to teach them something. And they're like, well, I drink because it helps. No, it doesn't. Humanity, right, as a race, has been drinking since somebody said, I'll eat that rotten fruit, and then they got a buzz off of it, right? It has never helped us get through anything. So just because you're drinking right now, we would have figured it out a millennia ago. If we knew that was the cure-all, we would have been doing it. What they're doing is they're messing with physiology, right? That's what they're doing. They're trying to shut off parts of themselves. They're trying to go, they're not, I ask them all the time, why drink past the buzz? If your goal is just to get drunk, why are you going past the buzz? You're drinking for function. That's what you're doing. There's a functional approach to your drinking. You're drinking to pass out because you don't want to deal with these things, right? Um, we kind of talked about the cognitive neural map, so I won't kind of go into that. So the amygdala, right? Two of them, ram's horns, right, is, is what they thought. Um, it's the brain's fear center. This works both shifts. Day and night, swing, it's always there. It's that supervisor that shows up all the time. You're like, damn, he's still here? Like, yeah. Does he have a wife, kids? Does he ever go home? Is she? That's what the amygdala is. It's always looking, right? You can't take your breaks around the amygdala. It's looking. It is the brain's fear center, right? That's what it does. That's its only job. It controls the brain's ability to coordinate many responses to emotional stimuli, right? And we're talking about responses, we're talking about physiological responses, not psychological ones. So the endocrine, autonomic behavior, all that, right? Primary fear stimuli, stress, anxiety, those produce responses because those are the things that we have to care about, right? The amygdala is supposed to mediate and say how these all come together. So when you think about the amygdala, it's not that it's a bad part of you, but it's the part of you that does not understand reality. This is why fears can be anything. Because the amygdala doesn't care about what you're afraid about. It's just a, it just cares that you're afraid. And I'm going to keep you safe. It is most notably involved in brain structure, right? Emotional responses and the formation of emotional memories. The amygdala and the hippocampus act synergistically to form long-term memories of significantly emotional events, right? So what that's saying is once the hippocampus gets involved, and let's say that there is an episodic memory, the amygdala's like, tag in, old school wrestling, right? The rockers, all right, hey, it's my turn. Now that you've let me know that this is a significant thing, let me make sure we're safe, right? That dual activation, them cross-talking, right? gives our emotional memories their uniqueness. That's why some things hurt more than others when your emotions are involved because it's what it, it's like. So my wife, love her, been with her almost 20 years. We met when I was 19. Mother of my beautiful children, all these things. Um, she has been jacking up my grandmother's peach cobbler recipe for about 18 years, right? <laughs> now my wife's a foodie, right? She's going to Dean and DeLuca. She's getting all these great ingredients and she's creating this peach cobbler and I taste and I say it's trash. And she's like, what? I've done as much as I can. I'm like, you're not getting it. Here's the problem. My wife is trying to compete with an emotional episodic memory. When my grandmother made that cobbler, it ain't just the cobbler. It's Al Green playing in the background. It's her letting me taste a bit of the crust. It's her kissing me and telling me I'm her favorite. All those things, when I taste it, I taste all of that. All that emotional goodness. I don't, and here's the thing, my grandmother was poor. It's not like she went to Cordon Bleu to learn how to be a pastry chef. She was getting regular things that she could afford. But this is why we say colloquially, right? It was made with love. Love is that, that, that emotional memory. If somebody makes something for you, have, have somebody that doesn't know how to cook make something for you. You're gonna love that they made it for you even though it tastes horrible, right? You're gonna be like, oh, this was horrible, but the, the love you put into it, right? Because that is a quantifiable thing. And our brains is doing the same thing. That is a positive example of an emotional memory. What do you think happens with a negative one? The same thing happens. When I'm sitting in group, when I'm talking to my guys and they're talking about the coppery taste of blood from a kid they had to shoot, that's the same thing. That's the same exact thing. It has created this emotional memory 
that now has this uniqueness in, it's not going to go away in the ether. It's just not going to disappear. It has to be processed. Keep in mind, right, because I'm talking to varied groups of people, for you students, processing isn't thinking. It's not thinking about something. Processing, when we say processing, we're talking about a physiological process. It is moving that memory from the hippocampus to where it needs to go. It's so that I don't feel triggered every day. It should be a memory of pain, not pain. So I should be able to remember how my middle school girlfriend broke up with me and not break out in tears, right? Tracking that? Um, something unique about the amygdala is hemispheric specializations, right? There's a left and a right amygdala. And there are functional differences between the two, right? In one study, they found electrical stimulations of the right amygdala induce negative emotions, especially fear and sadness. So stimulating that right amygdala gives you that fear, sadness response, right? In contrast, stimulation of the left amygdala was able to induce either pleasant or unpleasant emotions. Other evidence suggests that the amygdala plays a role in the brain's reward system. Why is this important? Because with the research that we're learning right now, the amygdala plays a lot in substance use disorders. A lot. This is also where you get adrenaline junkies from and gambling and all. That being stimulated, Remember, it's taking that stimuli and it's saying it has to fit. That being stimulated plays a lot, a whole lot into why they keep going back to it and what's going on. So a lot of times when they think they are beating the system, they're really just stimulating another part of their brain. It's still like, well, you're still in a fear. It is, if you ask anybody, you know, I have a lot of gamblers that come in, a lot of, you know, addicts. There is a thrill that they say they don't get with anything else. They're talking about that stimulation. They're talking about what it means to, I know this is my mortgage payment right now, but if I win it, oh my God. But that thrill, that's that stim, remember, psychological versus physical, that's the that stimulation, that's that piece that they keep going for. When it says the right hemisphere is associated with negative emotion, it plays a role in the expression of fear by processing fear-inducing stimuli, right? Still linked to our declarative memory, which is our facts and information from previously experienced events, right? So when the right hemisphere is going, that declarative memory has to be consciously recalled, right? So that means that that person is thinking about it and that's where the trigger comes from. But that episodic memory can also consist of autobiographical aspects, right? So you can recall this personal emotion, sensory, and you don't even have to consciously recall it. This is what we call passive triggering. This is where someone just, if I have been molested by a gym teacher with a beard, then I may just not like people with beards and I really don't know why. I haven't dug into the box, but I just know that there's just something about this person that I don't like because it's not a conscious recall, it's that, unc it's that box that's there that's like, oh, you tipped it over? It's something in there. Trauma triggers are a combination of episodic memory and fear conditioning. When you have a trauma memory remember, or trauma trigger, remember going back to what we talked about with trauma, it's all subjective. So the fact that I can be afraid of anything means that I can create the world in which I play, right? I tell my patients, right, because I've done a lot of high speed, low drag stuff, but I'm still human, right? So I use this to um, elucidate the point. I have one fear in my life, and that fear, I'm not afraid of heights or, you know, you could be eight foot eight, I'd still take a swing on you. My only fear in this world is woodland creatures, like squirrels, rats, rabbits, mice. You guys are clinicians, you should do a lot better than, I expect that from my guy. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm definitely afraid of that. So I did a little psychoanalytic work. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with me growing up very humble, which means poor. And uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, cause it's the face. It's the face of it that throws me off, right? So I think that when I was young, I may have lived in a house with mice or something that got too close to me and it stamped itself, right? Once it stamped itself, that box is there. Now, as we all know, as long as it's not life interfering, it's hard to call it a disorder, right? So if I worked in a sanctuary, Woodland Sanctuary, I'd have a disorder. But because I'm a trauma therapist, I'm okay, right? But there have been many a times where I've had to call my wife to get the squirrels away from our house so I could get out, right? 
that's my now inside of me that rational part of my brain knows i could punt a squirrel like just across but we're not talking about ration right we're not talking about that at all we're talking about a fear response so my brain sees that face and it immediately sub thresh above threshold freaks out and it's like that's it you're done right my kids will get a lion in my house before they get a rabbit right that's how visceral the reaction is right so as that fear conditioning happens over and over again what i start to do is have aversive qualities so i don't go around the things that are going to trigger me but because it's not so life interfering i'm okay with it what if my trigger were people what if my trigger were places remember i'm creating things in my mind so if that's the truth, then anything can start to be a threat. So I'll have these guys come in, and girls, and they'll give me all these reasons why their amygdala is correct. Well, David, you don't understand. This world is dangerous. Now it's actually getting safer. Well, no, it is. I know it's hard for you to believe because you've been in war, but that's not the way the world is actually. Well, there's spots of, I get what you're saying, but there's this thing we call world wars we used to have, right? Where everybody was fighting, right? We're not having those right now. So then they start to tell me how they pattern their lives. Well, David, you know this world is so crazy. You know, Kansas City's crazy. So if I got to go to Walmart, I'm going to go at 4 a.m. in the morning. So that way I ain't got to be around nobody. And I say, oh, my God, you're stupid. And they say, David, because <laughs> I'm still a Marine. David, what do you mean? So you're going to go get milk at 4 a.m. The normative value people, right? We're getting milk at 4 p.m. Have you ever looked around at Walmart at 4 a.m.? You did not make yourself safer. That's where the tweakers are. That's where you're going in to get milk with the most dangerous people that you think. Also, it's all the other triggered people that are getting it there. But because that amygdala is screaming at you, you're going to make decisions based on that. That fear condition is so solid that you start to think that you are manipulating the world and really you're manipulating yourself. This is, we use a couple of trauma modalities in our program, uh, cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure, right? Prolonged exposure fights the fear conditioning spot on, right? If I wanted to get over my aversion to woodland creatures, I do a lot of prolonged exposure work, right? I'm not, so I see some of your faces, it's not happening, but <laughs> because it's not life interfering yet, right? It's not to that point. But we use a lot of prolonged exposure, which means I take my guys out into the community. Our program is inpatient, but they're not stuck in the building the whole time. We go and do quote unquote normal things. So I'll take my guys out for lunch and we'll be sitting in the Denny's and they're all in tactical positions in Denny's. They're looking at everybody. They're watching everything and they're telling me, you know, everything that's going on. Look at that guy. He's gotten up. This guy hasn't even ordered yet. They're doing all that. And I say, man, you're still being stupid. No, David, what do you mean? Your amygdala doesn't care about probability. It only cares about possibility. So the reason why I'm scared of squirrels is because it's possible one could attack me. Possible. The probability is in my prefrontal cortex. That's low. So when I ask them what's the most probable threat in that Denny's, what is it? What do you guys think the most probable threat in that Denny's is? That food. You're worried about ISIS coming in and shooting you up and the cook's not using gloves, right? Like, you're not in a probable threat world. You are too worried about things that, and, and get, don't get me wrong, because what they'll say is it's happened. Yeah, but if ISIS's grand plan, all the planning, all the stuff, is to kill 13 people in a Denny's, I'm not really worried about that organization as a terrorist threat, right? Now, what helps me with my guys is what we call, I, they can't refute me because I've been through the same things that they have. So it's easy for them to say, well, you don't, no, nah, I've, I've been there, I've done that. I'm living my life freer than yours. I, am, I don't have a problem with vig vigilance. If I come in a room, I'm looking at my exits, I'm watching all you guys, I see what's going on. Hypervigilance is an amygdala response. Hyperarousal is amygdala response. That's the problem. So when you get stuck into that place, once you get that, that conditioned aversive stimulus, you're going to react to it. It is totally fine for me to be scared and say, oh, it's not right for me to, ah! Oh! That's because that cortisol is in my system. It's gained, so I'm not ready for what I think I am. Um, so, and I won't 
you guys know all this, so I don't have to spend much time on this. But that, this is just talking about the physiological approach to condition, how the amygdala works, right? So activation at pituitary gland, secretion of ACTH, as you guys all know. Adrenal gland is activated almost si simultaneously. It's letting out epi, right? The release of this chemical message Messenger creates the production of cortisol. This is how that gets into our system. This is why that happens. Once cortisol is in your system, then that, that's giving your, your body all, the, all that it needs to increase blood sugar, uh, pressure, suppress the immune system, all those things. You are literally getting ready for an action. That's what, that's what you're doing. The problem is it's supposed to be a breaking of a case emergency button. You're not supposed to live charged up all the time. So what happens is the system starts to wear down. I don't care how great your car is, if you put it on a lift and you keep gas in and you keep the accelerator down, that motor's gonna lock up eventually. The friction, the heat, I don't care, it's gonna happen. So these guys and girls that are running around with the stress response in their system, it starts to have chronic pain, headaches, those degradations start to happen. Some of the things that this amygdala will do, right? Acceleration of heart and lung action. Paling or flushing or alternating between both. Inhibition of stomach and upper intestinal action to the point where digestion slows down or stops. Why? Because you're about to get ready to do something. It's not time to be digesting the steak, right? Quick, quick note for those of you that, that like little catches. Um, when the stress response happens, everything above the diaphragm, this is normally speeds up, everything below it speed, slows down. So your breathing starts to get better but everything below it. So it's because your body's trying to oxygenate your muscles, trying to get things going. Uh, general effects on the sphincter of the body, right? One of the, one of the, it's about week one, second or third session, I get this. Hey David, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah brother, what's up? Hey man, they always look around. Yeah man, my stuff isn't working. Well, what do you mean? I already know what they mean, but I like to drag it out. <laughs> Whatever do you mean? <laughs> Um, yeah, man, it's just, you know, and I have to explain to them, yeah, you don't got any blood flowing down there. There's a lot of stuff because sexual dysfunction comes with that. And it, or they'll tell me, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed, but I'm peeing on myself. Yeah, that happens too. Because when you are afraid, especially at night, having those boxes open up those nightmares, where you're afraid, your body's going to do what it has to do because it does not care about decorum. I'd rather be pissy and alive than a full bladder and dead. Anything to jettison, anything to make me lighter. Any, so that's the response, right? Uh, constriction of blood vessels in many parts of the body, liberation of metal, metabolic energy sources, dilations of blood vessels for muscles, dilations of pupil, relaxation of bladder, relaxation of bladder, inhibition of erection. Don't know what that is. Auditory exclusion. Uh, <laughs> auditory exclusion, right? Loss of hearing. Uh, inhibition of lacrimal gland, right? Responsible or hyper hyperproduction of lacrimal gland. What's funny about that is a lot of people that don't understand how trauma and your amygdala is working, they don't get certain things. Like um, my wife, when she's really mad, she starts to cry. That's the scariest part for me because I know she's ready for action. But because she has a cognitive approach to it, she's looking at her crying as weakness. That's her body saying you are getting ready to do something, right? But when people don't understand it, they go auditory exclusion, right? Tunnel vision. Why do you think that happens? We call it fog of war in the military, but why do you guys think that happens? Why do you think that you, you start to lose stuff in your hearing and your vision becomes very, very point in time focused? What do you guys think that what's happening? Students, the doc, they already know. Don't look over there for help. <laughs> what do you think is going on? It's, it's, an important piece of survival, but there's something that happens. Your senses can trick you all the time. So what happens is the ones that can jam you up the most, your brain tries to fix immediately. Every one of you have walked around your house because you heard something, you didn't hear nothing. Your brain just made, oh, what? And you're running around with a bat or a shoe or something, looking for somebody who's never been in your house in the 20 years you've lived there, right? But you're dead set. Your vision, is so tied to your cognitive abilities that it has to be focused, right? Um, this is called a finger test, right? I want you guys to take your finger and put it right in front of you, right? And I want you to look at the edge of it, right? And now I want you to place that on your nose. You can unfocus and place it on your nose. 
just like me. Now I want you to look back at your finger while it's on your nose, while it's still on your nose, and I want you to move it left and right, tracking it with your eyes, right? Now I want you to take it off, look at it again, now put it back on your nose, and do it one more time, left and right. All right, were you able to see your finger fuzzily, but you could kind of see it, you're tracking it? You know what you've never seen in your life? Your damn nose. You know why? Because that's a cognitive, not an ocular trick. Your brain says, you will have an aneurysm in here trying to see your nose right now. You've only seen your nose in a picture or a reflection. Well, why is that? Because your brain knows something you don't. It's like, well, you're not really an apex predator, but you're near the top of the food chain, but you don't have an elongated beak or a snout, so we had to keep that field of vision clear. If I notice my nose every day, I know it's not an ocular trick because I can track my finger. I can push on my actual nose. So my eyes aren't the problem. My mind is literally telling me in utero, right? Don't, don't see that. So if your eyes can be tricked that easily in survival, what do you think it has to do for the eyes? Focus right in. It has to move all the sensory information out the way and give you that tunnel vision because it's saying you can be distracted way too easy. I see some of you still trying to see your nose, stop it. You're gonna, you're gonna pass out, all right? <laughs> we gotta do some ALS in here, all right? Calm down, all right? <laughs> uh, shaking, disinhibition of spinal reflexes, right? The amygdala also helps you store memories, right? Particularly emotions and physical sensations, right? Our phys physical sensations are what we call our senses, right? Um, if you grew up like I did and went to public school, you were taught there were only five senses. Incorrect. There are five primary senses. But your brain has so many different ones. Here are a couple of them. The somatic, interoceptive, organic, proprioception. You guys know what that is? How you, of course you do. Great. So what happens is when I start to move through my life with trauma, all of my senses are affected, not just the five that I know. Right? So let's take something like proximity, right? What we have coined colloquially as personal space is a sense. It's that bubble we got around us, right? So if I was to walk up to one of my patients and get closer to them, they're going to get uncomfortable because my junk is getting closer to them, right? They're going to they're gonna be like, hey, David, that's there. Well, how do we know that's a sense, right? Because I have four children, and that sense has never went off when one of them has hit me in my testicles. It's never been something that said, you're about to be attacked. Why? Because I see my children as safe, even though I shouldn't. No one's hit me more than my children. <laughs> but inside of me, remember subjectively, my children are the safest thing in the world to me. So that never goes off. If I'm on an elevator and somebody gets too close, I'm like, come on, man. Like, how close are you? Like, isn't this uncomfortable for you too? That's that sense, right? So let's say you're deployed. What do you think you do with that sense? Do you pull it in or do you push it all the way out? Push it all the way out because you want to be as safe, but it doesn't turn off when you come home. That sense doesn't just readjust and just say, so now you can't be in the store. You're sitting in the parking lot waiting and one more person goes in the store. You're like, I'm done because your threat detector's off. And what I mean by that is if your threat detector, that amygdala is always firing, it's broken. No alarm should always fire. Some of you still got smoke alarms, I'm a firefighter, going off in your homes right now. You're ignoring them because you've never changed the battery. So you're just, you don't take it as a threat. So you don't know if it's gonna be a fire or not, you just know that it's always been going off. So you have to be very, very careful with that. Emotions, they also get tied, because remember we talked about episodic memory and emotional uniqueness. So emotions also get tied to that fear response. Some of my people who do not understand how it works don't realize that you have fight, flight, and freeze. And we now, research is showing that fond dynamic, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But when your brain is giving you these options, that's all you're getting. There is no cognitive approach to a reaction. There's a cognitive approach to a response. But we're not talking about response. We're talking about reaction. So when people are traumatized, most times what they're doing is reacting to what's going on. So I will have someone who's a victim of sexual assault tell me, David, I should have fought him off. And they'll feel bad about that. They'll feel bad that they did not pick the fight response until I have to educate them. You don't get to pick it. And whatever it picked was right because you're still alive. 
So now we can deal with the memory of the attack and you're not dead. Because what you, when I, when I teach this in my, in my program, I show a video of, there are lions on the Serengeti and they catch this delicious animal, something they always eat, gazelle or antelope or something. Grab it by the neck and they're about to pull it over to eat it. And as they're about to eat it, these hyenas run up. When the hyenas run up, they go off to chase the hyenas away, the gazelle gets up and runs away. That is not the gazelle thinking, oh my God, they're about to eat me. Let me play it cool until they, no, that is a reaction. A reaction is so much different than a response. If you've ever spotlighted a deer, that should teach, deer spend their whole lives worried about getting eaten. They're like, oh, what the hell was that? They can't even drink without something's about to eat me, right? Shine light in a deer's face, what happens? Stops immediately. Because there's a reaction, there's a freeze component to that. This is what I'm telling you, and when you're talking to patients, you have to get them to understand that if you chose to freeze, that's a good choice. That's a good choice, you're still here. There is no shame in you not fighting off your attackers because you didn't, your, your brain didn't give you that option. That's not the option that you got. Yes, you may have wished that you could fight, but you didn't. And who knows if that would have been better. You're just living in a world where you scripted it now that you, because now you have all the pieces, it's easy to look back at anything and say, oh, they could have did it better. It's like going to see a movie you're really excited for and you're like, oh, Captain Marvel, they could have did it better, right? Because now that you've seen it, you say, oh, I would have done this and that, or they could have done it. But up to that point, you did not know what they were going to do. In PTSD, the amygdala becomes overreacting, causing frequent or near constant high level stress hormones. Moving into our prefrontal cortex. So you got your hippocampus with the boxes. You got the amygdala responding to it. Then you have your prefrontal cortex, right? Your pref prefrontal cortex, PFC, helps assess threats manage emotions, plans responses, controls impulses. It's the center of rational thought. Childhood trauma causes the underdevelopment of the prefrontal cortex. What's most important about this is this manage and control. Those aren't put there by happenstance. You cannot control an emotion. Well, why? Because emotions lie in that limbic system and the prefrontal cortex hierarchy was built after, right? So you can't necessarily control an emotion. You can't manage them though, but you can't control it. If try to control your anger, at best you're gonna get passive aggressive, at best. You're not gonna make yourself happy just by saying I wanna be happy. That's not what it is. What you have to do is manage the responses that are there, right? You gotta control your impulses. That's the control. That impulsivity is what you have to control. That's what you're looking for. That's where that brain piece is getting activated, right? Every time your PFC is involved, it is what you think of as you in a organic space. It's been implicated in planning complex cognitive behavior, personality expression, decision making, moderating social behavior. It is considered to be the orchestration of thoughts and actions in accordance with internal goals. So your, your prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that you want to make the decision on if something's dangerous. Um, I don't know how to go. Uh, so if you see this first one, it says helps assess threats. This is where my guys get thrown off because they're like, well, I just don't want to be unsafe out there. No, your prefrontal cortex helps assess threats. What it does is if it is a threat, it passes the baton to the amygdala. Keep me safe. There are situations where I don't want my PSC to be involved. If a dog runs in here right now, and my prefrontal cortex is like, is that a rescue? How many pounds is that? It's going, I don't need all that information. I need my amygdala to get involved and say, curl up, do something. So your, your, your PFC is that. Most of my guys don't want to be sheep, so they try to be a wolf. And I tell them there's another person in that story, the shepherd. You want to be the shepherd. You're sitting around, you're waiting. If something happens, you grab your crook, you beat the crap out of the wolf, and you go on with your day. But you don't want to be always waiting for something to happen because it's going to take a toll on you. We don't have to get too much in this, but just talking about executive function. You guys know what executive function is, so I don't really have to spend too much time on that. Most times during sleep, prefrontal cortex is inactive, but during periods of lucid dreaming, it can manage a me measure of self-awareness or control, right? One of my favorite movies in the world is built on this concept, Inception, right? That we wake up in stages. 
And that's what most people don't understand. You're not just waking up, it's parts of your brain opening up at different points. Sometimes when that PFC is activated and the hippocampal region is right there, you get that lucid dreaming and you're able to say, oh, this is a dream. You're able to look and be like, my wife doesn't have a horse head. Oh, all right, this must be a dream. Most times you don't know. You're not aware of what reality is because the hippocampus and the amygdala do not know reality. The prefrontal cortex is what it, and because everything is sensory, right? We'll get a little, we'll get a little deep, right? A little quantum theory, right? Nothing's happening in the moment. Everything is an image of it. So because emotions and stimuli affect us on an organic level so much, you can feel like everything's real in a dream because all the senses that are coming to you are the ones that are coming to you in reality. Right now, one of you can wake up and be like, man, I was in a damn presentation this morning. You're sitting at home sleep and you would say, oh, it felt so real. Well, yeah, because the same things, the same signals, the same neurons, the same transmitters are happening at night. Guilt, remorse, interpret reality, they're all dependent on a well-functioning PFC, right? Severe emotional trauma causes lasting changes in the VPFC, right? This region regulates negative emotions like fear that, that occur when confronted with a specific stimuli. What this is saying is you want your PFC to be very rational about the fear because then you can live a life. If you can be afraid of anything and everything, then you don't get anywhere, right? But you still have to be afraid of some things. So that PFC lets you know what that distinction is. You can't be afraid of everything, but you can't not be afraid of some things. So that's that part of you, right? PTSD patients show a marked decrease in the volume of this, right? And this explains why people suffering PTSD to exhibit fear, anxiety, and extreme stress responses, even when faced with stimuli not connected or only remotely connected to their experiences from the past. Once it's an overdrive, that amygdala, you can just be triggered by something that is close to your fear. Just close. When I first, I'm a local kid. When I first got back from Afghanistan and I came here after a year and some change, um, I went to get barbecue. I was a Gates man then now I'm a Joe's guy. But I went to get barbecue. And I remember smelling the barbecue and having this visceral, nauseated feeling. I felt like I was going to throw up because it smelled like burning flesh to me. But if you ever smell burning flesh, it's a very distinct smell. But it's not hickory season, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully not. Right? I don't know your life. Right? <laughs> Hopefully not. So my brain took enough of that burning flesh and said, oh, trigger. And I couldn't even eat. My friends, we had to go somewhere else because it felt like that, right? And that's what this is saying. When those boxes are open and active, anything can trigger. We just have a couple minutes left. Yes, ma'am. Right. Wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Current triggers, um, and this, we'll go through this very quickly, but this is a trigger process. Current triggers, think boxes. Hippocampus recalls a part of the fragmented, disintegrated memory. So the hippocampus goes through the box, amygdala reacts. Body move, memory activated, flashback, right? Flashbacks aren't as sensationalized as TV makes it. Not everybody's crawling on the ground with this feeling of bombs and things going around them. Flashbacking is a re-experience of an event is you feeling like you're back in that place. I've had patients who have flashback off the cologne that I wore. You know, and like you, you smell like my attacker. So you know what I did as a clinician? Wore even more cologne. I'm not a rapist. So you don't get to create a reality where that you have to now prolong exposure. We got to get that back to a neutral stimulus because it has to be. If you just are going to spend your life being afraid of uh, a popular cologne, that's not that's not prefrontal cortex. That's amygdala, right? Uh, interprets as a current threat, right? Fight, flight, and freeze response happens. Prefrontal cortex at that point is unable to tag in, so it can't determine if it's safe, so it can't manage controlling impulses. Attempts to escape or avoiding, this is very, very important, to escape or avoid distress and memories and feelings mean the memory is never processed, so the symptoms will remain. If the box is never addressed, the symptoms remain. Your brain's not getting rid of it. So you have to do some work to get rid of it. Um, overview, we don't really need to do you guys kind of know what that is. Uh, it's talking about comorbidity, how it alters brain chemistry. Uh, quick note, by delving in pathophysiology of PTSD, they have also realized that the disorder is reversible. Reversible, not curable, right? We're talking about getting you back to the highest level of functioning, letting their prefrontal cortex have the lead again. You're not curing trauma because you can't get rid of the events that happen to you. 
So it's not a cure thing. Human brain can be rewired, right? You know, neuroplasticity, of course, you guys understand that. Drugs and cognitive behavioral therapies have been able to show the volume of the hippocampus being increased and also the prefrontal cortex. Um, little, little quick little, and any quick questions? I'm either a great teacher or too early. Uh, and of course, the emphasis are impeccable. Here we go right here. Uh, for those you don't want to look at it. Uh, um, all right. Thank you. Thank you guys for your time.